Airport Station Bravo, 1747 through the weather, wind 3206, visibility 10, sky clear, temperature 260.16, altimeter 29907. ILS, running 29 right approaching east, landing and departing runways 29 er Torrance Tower, frequency 133.07 for the north runway, 124.0 for the south runway. Notice the airmen rolling channel left, fast is out for maintenance. Use caution for activity on in the vicinity of the airport. Caution work in progress, adjacent all taxiways and runways. Hazardous weather information for California coastal waters available on flight service frequencies. All aircraft read back hold for instruction, rolling assignment with your call sign. Advise on initial contact. You have information, bravo. All right, so welcome aboard everyone. We have information, bravo, departing torrents here. Beautiful clear skies, nice hot afternoon. It's 30 degrees Celsius out. And uh, welcome, uh, welcome on board. Come along. We're headed up north uh, to the desert, and uh, hope you all enjoy it. Hang out. Here we go. Torrance ground. Good uh, morning, uh, Station Air One Two One Five Golf. East T's looking to taxi with information. Bravo. Say again. Station Air One Two One Five Golf over at the East T's ready to taxi with Bravo. Station Air 1215 Golf, Torrance, Don Roger, runway 29 right, taxi via Juliet. 29 right, taxi via Juliet, 1215 Golf. All right. Clear right, clear left. Clear, clear. All looks good. And we'll go to the far end corner here of the run-up. There we go. There we are. And we turn it around. All right. There we are. All right. Let's get some run-up coming. There we go. That's good. Electrical system is looking good. Starting is 1840. Large ground, sling 169, Tango Whiskey at sling, requesting taxi to 200 right with information Bravo. Sling 169, Tango Whiskey, Torrance Ground Roger, runway 200 right, taxi via Echo Alpha Juliet. Taxi, taxi via Echo Alpha Juliet, 200 right for Niner Tango Whiskey. 120 and 90, both within 150 and 75 of each other, back to both. And while we have uh, the RPMs at 1800, we'll go and do a prop check. So I'm bringing the prop lever back, and I see the manifold pressure, RPM, and oil pressure. I'll do what I want them to do. So that's good. And now we'll get an idle check coming. And that is good. Nice and kosher. There we go. Lean the mixture out. In fact, I'll get 1201 right over there, 2855. There we go on the standby, and we're headed up to 45 for LA special flight rules. And here we have it. We'll load up our flight plan. There we go. Menu, invert flight plan. There we have it. All looks good. Solid. All right. That's good. Fuel selector is on both. Cal flaps are open. Trims are both set for takeoff. Prop levers full forward. I'll get the mixture forward here as I take the runway. I want to keep it lean for now. It's nice and hot out. Flaps 10 degrees. Visually verified. Lights are all on. Everything looks really, really, really good. Plane looks good. The indications are good. Everything's working fine. We'll go ahead and get a uh, takeoff briefing going. And uh, today, uh, as you briefly saw me plug in there, we're going to head to uh, LA Special Flight Rules. So I'm going to conduct a normal takeoff off of runway 29 or right in the event of any abnormalities necessitating me to come to a stop. I'll go ahead and cut the power, stop straight ahead, 
and taxi off the runway if possible. Otherwise, anything happens. Otherwise, if anything happens after rotation, uh, with runway ahead of me to land back on, I'll cut the power, tilt the nose down, and uh, land straight ahead. Anything after rotation with no runway ahead of me to land back on, I'll do the same thing, just avoid sharp turns, especially if I'm uh, low to the ground, right or left. I'll keep it coming straight while pitched for best glide and uh, avoid obstacles best I can. Only if I'm high enough to where I can guarantee a uh, turn back to the airport and land back on the runways will I'll attempt the 180 uh, turn back to the airport. Otherwise, I will not even go there. Um, everything looks good. We'll head up to 4-5 and then head towards uh, LA Special Flight Rules, the corridor, and then uh, head Hi. north uh, eastbound towards uh, Toronto. So, hope you guys enjoy it. Um, what I did on this flight, actually, I figured I get so many emails, um, as you can imagine, from so many different people's a people asking different questions. So what I did, I, I wrote down about five or ten, I can't remember, um, questions that in my head happened to be repetitive, meaning people, these are, I don't know if they're the top, but in my head it appears that these questions keep coming again and again and again for people. So I figured I'd write it down, and on my flight up to Toronto, talk about some things. Um, so if you're one of the people who emailed me asking this question, here's your answer. Although I do reply to all emails personally, but maybe I'll expand a little more now talking about it uh, verbally. Um, otherwise, if you haven't emailed and asked me these questions, I hope you find the information helpful. Um, it does cover some flight training stuff, some different things. So anyway, that's what I figured we'll do on this flight. So really, this is like an email question answering uh, flight. So hang out, relax, and uh, we'll get going. And once we get up to cruise and everything settles, we'll uh, we'll get talking about stuff. So here we go. Everything looks good. All righty. Here comes Torrance Tower. I drink off my Clear left. left. If any aircraft would like the south runway and left close pattern, I've got several inbound for the IOS approach. So it's going to be extensions a little bit here. Tower uh, station there, 1215 Golf, short of 29 right, ready for takeoff right now on departure. 1215 Golf, Torrance Tower, Roger, uh, right down when you said? Affirmative, 115 Golf. 115 Golf, Roger, stand by. 6-9-1 Golf, can take 29 left. 6-9-1 Golf, Roger, extend down when contact south tower 124.0, start a climb to or above 1,600. 1,600 and over to south tower 124.0, 6-9-1 Golf. 3 Golf, Golf Mike, Torrance Tower, I understand that was you calling low approach right down one. Low approach right down one, 4 2 right, 8 Golf Mike. Running Lima Papa, turn uh, base, running 2 9 right, clear, touch and go. Number 3. 4 3 right, 4 Thanks, turn base. So actually I wrote down uh, seven questions uh, that appear to be that I in my head are, stu like, uh, just keep that are so stuck as questions that I get again and again, and so right we'll cover seven questions, I wrote them down. We're looking for that traffic and we'll keep us lower. It'll be fun. Thank you. Man, it's getting hot. Summer's here. 28 degrees outside. Absolutely crazy. Nine, Papa, or correction, number five is staying on traffic off your right sling. It's going to cross over you. 1,600 indicated break. Number nine, William Papa, off your right sling. Uh, 1,700 indicated going to cross southbound. Uh, we'll be looking for that traffic off your right sling. Break off mic, one o'clock, one and one half miles, 1,200 indicated. We're looking at off mic. Four ceiling, let's turn southbound. He is busy. I think so. Southbound, four ceiling, mile. He is Point definitely guard, busy. Seven nine six 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 towards Tower. Stand by. Hey, God, Mike has uh, traffic inside maintain visual. Four six Charlie running two nine right clear to low approach. Hey, God, Mike. Hey, golf, Mike. Break off, Mike. Your number three, uh, following Seth on uh, two and a half mile final, running two nine right, clear to low approach after low approach. Right down one's approved. Report the Cessna a mile and a half ahead of you in sight, so you could follow them. We have that traffic inside, clear low approach. Right down one departure. Break off, Mike. Break off, Mike. Will you be going back to SoCal? Uh, negative. We'll be going via far back to the harbor. Break off, Mike. Roger. He is a busy man. Look at this. Lots of uh, ILS action. Request that low approach on this one. 
Uh, the five twenty-two on the right, cleared low approach. Number two, following swing short final. Number two, got that traffic. Uh, cleared low approach. Four hundred and ninety-five. Four hundred and sixty-five. Squawk VFR. Squawk VFR. Sixty-four. Sixty-five. Number seven, Victor Bravo. Extend that one. Extend that one. Number seven, Victor Bravo. Seven nine six whiskey whiskey torn star you called. Seven nine six whiskey whiskey inbound on the ILS two nine right. Six whiskey whiskey Raj continue in mile number three following uh, helicopter three mile final running two nine right clear to land. Continue inbound following helicopter number three uh, two nine right clear to land six whiskey whiskey. And we wait. Good start work today. Cessna one seven two three seven nine at Tango Alpha now. Uh, Heading to the IOS Iowa in the harbor, and they're off to request at your CTR to go back to the field. Okay, if you're calling for the field, uh, 379 or Tingo Alpha Torrance Tower, I think that was you. Contact South Tower 124.0. 4.0, uh, 379 Tingo Alpha. South Tower. Number 4 Sierra Lima traffic 12 o'clock and 3 miles eastbound, 3600 indicated sling frequency change proof. Got traffic frequency inside. Frequency change approved, 6 4 Sierra Lima. Got the, got the traffic. Thank you. 7 Victor Bravo, call my base to right or right. 7 Victor Bravo, affirmative, I'll call your base, thank you. It's going to be a little bit, sir. I have uh, air, multiple aircraft uh, inbound. Call my base, 7 Victor Bravo, thank you. Take off mic, if able, continue our uh, uh, increased speed. Increased speed, take off mic. I have a feeling he'll get, me mic, out. he'll get me out, out of this one right here. Make off Mike, are you able to make a right turn prior to the runway at or below 600? Uh, yes, sir. Take off Mike. Take off Mike, thank you. Before the runway, then, uh, right turn at or below, maintain at or below 600 for your right downwind departure. And uh, once you're on the downwind, squawk VFR. Right turn before the runway at or below 600, and then VFR on the downwind. Take off Mike. Thank you. Tower sling 135 is Tango. Let's do a full stop. I was King and Roger, extend downwind. Any down at 5 Tango. Will he let me out? 7 Victor, bravo, um, turn base in one mile, running 2-9 right, clear touching, we're going to have a few departures prior to your arrival. Turn in uh, base 2-6 uh, right, uh, 7 Victor, bravo. 7 Victor, bravo, turn base in one mile, running 2 nine right, clear touching, go. Man, they're busy. Point Tower, Cessna 48340, over the Queen Mary, 1500, inbound 2 nine right, with bravo. Calling Torrance Tower, number 4340, Torrance Tower, contact South Tower, 124.0. 124.0, 340. Number 5, with Tingo traffic's turning right, crosswind, uh, just ahead in your right, they're going to be below you, at or below 600. Looking for that traffic, fire Tingo. 1215, Golf Torrance Tower, no delay, running 2 9 right, clear for takeoff right down when you're following Cessna in the crosswind turn. Alright, no delay, 2 9 right, clear for takeoff, 1215, Golf. Alright. We'll keep her rolling, mixture is full tingo. forward, here we go. Two nine on right, clear touch on go, seven Victor Bravo, thank you. And he got us out, look at that. Take off my thanks, squawk VFR, and uh, traffic's going to be above you, a uh, swing uh, at or above 1,000. We're defending meters. that center line. We have that traffic inside, take off Mike. Take off Mike, maintain the separation with that swing, thank you. Take off Mike. And we're off. If I was seeing the traffic below you, 500 indicated the helicopter, they are uh, on the northeast bound departure. Up 75 miles of the red line, flaps come up. Continue down over the refinery, 1,200 indicated. Torrance Tower, swing 165, Tango Whiskeys, uh, holding short 29 right, and uh, we'd like a right 270, please. 165, Tango Whiskey, Torrance Tower, right, stand by. And I'm in pocket, stand down. Stand down, we don't know. Fort Whiskey, Charlie, frequency change approved. Fort Whiskey, Charlie, frequency change approved, thank you. Break off, Mike, continue on that heading to exit the Delta, frequency change approved, great flight. There you go, Mike. Short two nine right, take uh, swing one six five, taking a whiskey tour and shower. Stand by, be ready for departure. Forty three four zero, turn and shower, you on? Forty three seven nine, single off, turn and shower, you on? All right, everything looks good. No, not calling you, three CLA, disregard. Okay, power looks good. Fuel flow looks good right where I want it. See, November 6th, please turn my pack to Charlie contact ground. No delay, please try to get a departure out. 
Cal flaps open, trims are good, flaps are up, everything is good. Nine five five to eleven o'clock, one mile, five hundred indicated helicopter southeast. Airport's off my right side, and everything's working. I'm monitoring. I'm one with the system. I'm not hand flying the airplane, but I'm making sure everything is looking as it should. If I whiskey tangle, you can turn base in a half mile, running two nine right, clear to land. I'm not a passenger looking right, out the window right now. Mile, right, at least until I verify that everything is good. The engine, the temperatures, everything's looking good. All right, airport is off our right side. There's 2,000 for 4,500. And ultimately, as we get up, uh, when, once we get on the other side of the uh, Bravo, our uh, final cruise altitude will be 9,500. Can, uh, can we cancel those altitude restrictions? Take off, Mike, affirmative cancel altitude restriction. Thank you. What altitude are you climbing to? We're going to be going to 1,500. Take off, Mike. All right, there's 24. Off, Mike, I'm no longer uh, in his airspace. Here comes LA special flight rules. I will do direct enter enter to my waypoint to enter LA, and then nav, and now the plane will turn flip left and head direct towards that next waypoint. I should definitely be up uh, at 4,500 by the time I reach Imperial Highway, so we're good to go there. Everything's looking good. Temperatures are good, engine's looking good, fuel flow's right where I want it. I'll give it even a touch more there, so it's happy. There's 3,000 for 4,500. Beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky, just a little hazy down there, but uh, everything's looking really, really good. Traffic above me here at uh, looks like uh, 6,500 feet or so inside the Bravo. There we go. LAX is right there in front of me at my 11 o'clock. And it should turn into my 12 o'clock as I continue to head towards it. There's 3,500 for 4 5. You'll hear that sound in a moment of 1,000 feet to go. There's that sound. So everything's working. I'm anticipating. I'm thinking what the system should be telling me, how it should be communicating with me. And if it is or isn't, as long as I'm aware, I'm able to pick up on these things. There's 3 7 for 4 5. Touch more right rudder. Sync my heading with my needle. Direct enter, enter, there we go. My banana's right here, so I should reach 4-5 well before I reach Imperial Highway. Torrance is right off our left, so we did a right downwind and then a left turn. So right now, um, it's off our left-hand side. Here's 4,100 for 4,500. And all looks good. I'll go ahead and set the power where I want it. So it'll be a nice, smooth level off. There we go. There we are, and we'll lean the mixture. We'll get out that right rudder, because we're leveling off. There's altitude hold mode. Five mile. South of Torrance Airport, uh, 4,500 will be northbound. All right, there we go. So 30, 23. That looks good. Solid. There we go. Temperatures are good. Everything is just as I want it. I'm on LA Special Flight Rules Frequency. And I'll go ahead and make a call. Even though I'm not yet at Imperial Highway, I'll go ahead and let people know, hey, I'm two miles to the south, four or five heading north westbound. So here we go. LA Special Flight Rules, uh, White Cessna is two to the south of Imperial Highway, 4,500 heading north westbound, LA Special Flight Rules. There we go. Everything is looking good. So as you realize, from takeoff all the way to now, I did not stop. I did not actively fly the airplane, but I was fully in control of it listening to what it's supposed to tell me, looking to make sure it's indicating what's, what it's supposed to indicate to me, making sure that we have coordination going, making sure that it's leveling off where it, where, it, where it should level off, where it told me it would level off, where the autopilot in a working manner would actually level off. That's my job as the pilot to monitor and make sure. Here's one thing I want to stress and drive home. I was thinking about it the other day. The autopilot is good at many things. But here's one thing the autopilot is horrible at. In fact, it's not horrible at. It simply is unable to do. And that is this. The autopilot is unable to ensure that the autopilot is working properly. There's, no, there's nothing built into the system to tell you 
hey, I did not level off at 4 or 5, if something's not working. Or another example, if you, the pilot, uh, set your ceiling or floor to a wrong number, there's nothing that will tell you, hey, wrong number, LA Special Flight Rules is 4 or 5, and now you're blowing through it. Uh, special Flight Rules Stereo, White Cessna 576, 3 mile, you still have a torrent, uh, northbound 4,500, LA Special. And so there's nothing in the autopilot that will check it other than you and the airplane uh, as the pilot. So keep that in mind. That's your job to make sure the autopilot's working properly. LA Special Flight Rules, White Cessna is 4,500 over Imperial Highway heading northwest down LA Special Flight Rules. It's your job to make sure that the autopilot's doing that. It's not the autopilot's job, and the autopilot can't and doesn't know how to do that. So keep that in mind. Autopilot does a lot of things for us. What it doesn't do for us is keep the autopilot in check and make sure that make sure that it actually is functioning properly. That's on us. That is our job as the pilot in the airplane. Just a way to think of it. LA Special Flight Rules, White Cessna is 4,500 over LAX heading northwestbound, LA Special Flight Rules. All right, all looks good in the hood. We're zipping, 140 ground speed. LA Special Flight Rules, White Cessna is 4,500 over Bologna Creek, heading northwestbound, LA Special Flight Rules. There we go. All looks good. Beautiful, beautiful day. Very cool. Santa Monica's right up here ahead of me. That'll be our last call. And then we'll turn slightly to the left there to avoid Burbank Charlie until we get in touch with uh, approach. But in our case today, I want to keep it uh, quiet in here because like I said before, we'll be answering some email questions. So we'll hold off flight following uh, at least until we get closer to the uh, MOAs. Uh, we'll see what, what's happening there. And so the plane will turn left here in a moment. And once we're out of the way, we'll establish into our nice climb and things will settle. We'll jump into the emails and talk about some, like I said on the ground, some common questions that I receive uh, for people who watch uh, these videos. Special Flight Rules Aerial, White Cessna 576, overhead Imperial Highway, uh, northwest bound, 4,500. All right, here we go. LA Special Flight Rules, White Cessna 4,500. Over Santa Monica, heading northwestbound, last call, LA Special Flight Rules. There we go. Okay, as always, I'm cognizant of this LA Bravo above me, which starts at five. So I won't yet climb to my uh, cruise altitude of 900,500, because I don't want to go right into the Bravo. So I'm keeping it at 4.5 for now. Uh, special Flight Rules Radio, White Cessna 576, crossing over South Salonay, LA. South Salonay over LA at 4,500, northwestbound, LA Fisher. All right. All looks good. Computer showing uh, 56 minutes left to our flight. Uh, should put us on the ground at 12.53 local time. Local time. All right. So here we go. As I said on the ground, um, many people periodically email me. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, having the channel be what it's about, um, over time, there are uh, questions that keep coming again and again and again from different people. Um, and so on my end... Uh, 
And so on my end, um, there uh, there's a lot of questions that people want answers to. And they happen to be popular questions. So what I did in no particular order is I wrote down seven questions, really just off the top of my head, that I have received in the past and continue to receive from people. And I figured, you know what, I'll make a video on it. I'm headed to Death Valley anyway. And so I'll hang out and we'll talk about uh, some, it will be an email uh, question answering session this flight. And like I said on the ground, if you're one of those who asked me this question in the past, although I do respond to all emails I receive, um, here's an answer. Uh, and maybe I'll expand a little more um, in the airplane talking about it right now. Otherwise, if you haven't asked me this question on email, and this question or answer pertains to you, then I hope you find the answer and the information helpful. So before we get going, I'll just raise my ceiling here and enter into a climb as I'm no the Class Bravo 5,000 foot shelf is no longer a factor. So here we go, 9,500. And we'll go ahead and actually we'll do a cruise climb. So we'll keep the power where it's at. I'll only go 2,400 RPM, which is the only thing I want to change, as well as the fuel flow. I want to go to 20 gallons an hour. But the manifold pressure I'll keep right where it's at. So here's 2,400 RPM. And there's 20 gallons an hour. And what I'll do is flight level change and nose up. Nose up all the way down here to 100 knots. And as you know, flight level change, the plane right now will take all the excess energy that we have and convert that into a climb. How does it do that? Well, I told it to maintain 100 knots. It has no power. The autopilot has no, not power, no access to my power. So its only way to slow down is by going uphill. Going uphill means we're going up and gaining altitude, which is a byproduct that I want. And so that's how flight level change works. So I told it to maintain 100. It said, whoa, we're going, we have way too much energy to maintain 100 while flying level. Because if we maintain four or five, our speed will climb way up. And so it's figured, ooh, to slow to 100, I have to pitch up as opposed to pitch down. And I, the pilot, know that, and it's a byproduct that I want, and I'm willing to accept it. Not only willing to accept it, it's something I want the plane to do. So there's flight level change. All right, so here we go. Okay, question number one. How old were you when you got your private, my private pilot certificate, and is it ever too late to become a pilot? Now, again, these questions I wrote down in my own words, like I said before, these are questions that are just on the top of my head um, that have been asked and continue to be asked again and again. So I just wrote it in my words. Um, so if this pertains to you, here we go. How old was I when I became a pilot, and is it ever too late? Or are you ever too old to become a pilot? So let's start with the first part. I was 25 years old when I got my private pilot certificate. Now, some of you watching this video might think, oh, wow, you were young. But others who soloed at 16... Uh, might not think that. Um, and that's the thing about flight training and flying and pilots. There's all kinds, colors, shapes, sizes, ages, everything, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, but yeah, I was 25 years old when I took my private pilot check ride and got my certificate. Um, always wanted to be a pilot, um, as I've said a few times on the channel, for years. It's interesting what happens as humans. As humans, when we don't know what something entails, what something takes to become or to achieve, it's amazing how our brain, instead of telling us, hey, you don't know, go find out, our brain often tells us, you don't know, that means you can't do it. Which is just a fascinating observation in general. It has nothing to do with flight training. Uh, and that was me. That was me with flight training for many, 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 many years. I wanted to be a pilot. But I lacked really the knowledge. I had no pilots in my family. I didn't really know what goes into it. I, for a long time, I thought, you know, you can only fly uh, if you're military. I didn't really know anything about this world. Um, and I put it off for many years just for that reason. In hindsight, I'm able to see it clearly as, I, as I'm explaining right now. Uh, but once I learned what goes into it, I'm not saying it became easy or, you know, just like a nothing. But it definitely uh, has gone from, it went from, I can't do it, or uh, I, I'm not someone who was born into a, a family with a, with a plane, and, and, and it would be difficult for me to do it. It went from that to this is possible. 
It is a journey that if I set my mind to it, um, and I, I put in the work that, it, that is required, I can obtain it, I can achieve it. And not in all that long. It doesn't take years to get your private pilot certificate. And so it's amazing what just gaining the knowledge of what goes into it, it shifted my thinking and I became um, a pilot. I got my private at 25. So that's for me, my specific situation. Some people in their 40s think they can't do it. Other people, in, when they're 17, they go for it and they get their private and they get other ratings. Um, and so there's all kinds. But to answer the question, I got my private pilot certificate when I was 25 years old. Now, I know this question is split into two parts. The second part of it is, is it ever too late? Meaning, are you ever too old to become a pilot? Many people, in fact, I'll be honest with you, the, uh, most of my students, the people I happen to work with, and this is just the way it is, it's not that I, I won't train a 17-year-old. The people I happen to work with happen to be uh, I would, I'm going with an average age of 40, 45 years old. That's just my clientele. Um, and so the first thing I'll tell you about that is, of course it's never too late to become a pilot. Now, if you're in your 80s, we have to acknowledge and appreciate the fact that, you know, maybe as an 80-year-old, you'll have a more difficult time studying and really learning new information and retaining it, maybe more difficult than you did when you were 20. And that has nothing to do with being a pilot. It has to do with being 80 um, and being human. Now, I'm sure some 80s, or some 80-year-olds could learn these things and nothing it, 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 with 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 ease. Um, but then, most probably with learning anything, the older you get, the the less easy. Uh, let's put it that way. It becomes. Now, that's from the uh, learning and cognitive standpoint of being human. Now. There's a whole other side to this. Many people want to become pilots in order to do certain things in the industry, such as fly for the airlines, uh, fly charter, fly uh, uh, private jets, um, or do different things. Many people I work with actually want to become pilots in order for them to fly their own jets. And so a thing that goes into that is I haven't trained a 70-year-old, but I'm just in my head starting to think, as I'm talking about this, if I were to come across someone in their 70s who said, I want to buy a plane and I need to learn how to fly, the older you get, you start running into some insurance stuff. Now, if it's not the insurance turning you down or not insuring you, especially as a brand new private pilot in your 70s, they look at all that. If it's not that, it will for sure come down to uh, your rates, your insurance rates being much higher than you would uh, want them to be. So, but that's, I don't see that happening until you start, you know, getting into the 70s. I don't even think 60s would be a big issue. Um, but that's really the only thing I see there. So, in terms of is it ever too late to become a pilot, the answer is of course not. You could get your private pilot certificate in your 90s. Um, will you get insured on your airplane? Probably not if you're a brand new private pilot. And if you will, it will be an insanely outrageous rate. Um, but then the other part is, if you want to do this in order to go and become an airline pilot, keep in mind, the airlines have a mandatory retirement of 65. So if you're 55 and you want to end up at the airlines, you could, and it won't take you that long these days if you're committed. You could get your 1,500 hours in a few years, and you might end up at the airlines for three, four, five years. You could. No one's saying you can't. Um, and airlines these days are hiring pilots of all ages um, and of all skill levels, and it's, there's a big shortage. Um, but just keep that in mind. So the short answer is it's never too late to become a pilot. You're never too old to become a pilot. And if your brain can learn the information and retain it, then you're good to go. And if it's something you've always wanted to do, I say go for it. Go for it. It's, in the fun it's an unbelievably rewarding challenge. And, um, and so I'm a big fan. So there's my answer about is it ever too late to become a pilot. So I hope that, hope that helps. Okay, I'm going to take a sip of water, and we'll keep going. That's one of seven. We have six more questions to burn through. There's eight five for nine five. All right, all looks good. There we go, 1,000 feet to go. Surprisingly smooth. 
Okay, here we go. What advice would you give all potential and or current student pilots? It's a great question. And it's a great question because there's things I realized about flight training. Here's the thing about every instructor out there, uh, every pilot really. Every single pilot and instructors have been student pilots themselves in the past. Um, for some it's been 50 years ago and for others it's been one year ago. But everyone uh, who's flying an airplane has at some point been a student pilot. And the reason I think this is a great question is as a student pilot myself, the view, the standpoint from which I've seen flight training and learning and the way I looked at it all was, I'm not saying it was a bad way, but it was very different than how I look at it today as someone who for a living, this is what I do, uh, this is my full-time passion, um, teaches and trains and um, gets pilots to do this better and I sit right next to them, I'm a foot from them as we go through this journey together. And being in this position has enabled me to see flight training as a whole and being a student pilot and really learning in a whole new different way. And so I appreciate this question, I think it's a great question. So as you can imagine, there's a million and one things or pieces of advice that I would give to a new pilot starting out. And most of them you probably heard, you probably know. But the biggest thing and if you watch these videos often, you probably maybe know where I'm going with this. The biggest thing that I could say, and this is where everything learning related begins. You could be a smart person. You could be a successful person. You could be uh, everything. But if you don't have, if you're missing this point as a student pilot, especially as someone who's just starting out, and maybe it's been a minute since you learned and acquired a new skill and new knowledge in your life. The biggest thing is this. Here's the biggest piece of advice I could give you as a pilot, student pilot, there's 9-5. It goes like this. Don't, and I know easier said than done, but I'll expand. Don't be hard on yourself. Don't be hard on yourself. You need to understand this. Let me break this down a little bit. You need to understand this. It took me a long time to get it myself, and I don't think I even fully got it when I was a student pilot. Now I do as an instructor. The whole point of flight training the entire point of flight training, all of it, all of it, is to mess up, is to not be perfect, is for your performance, especially initially, to be far from pretty. That is the whole point of getting in an airplane with a flight instructor and going flying. Because if you were perfect and if you were everything was pretty and great, you don't need a flight instructor. You're paying a lot of money for someone to sit there next to you and walk this journey with you in order to take you from, let's just be blunt for a second, horrific performance. And it's not horrific in the sense that you don't, you can't do something right. It's horrific in the sense that this is new to you. You've never landed an airplane. So yes, it will look horrifically scary maybe your first few landings. So the whole point of this journey of showing up to an instructor and saying, here's a bunch of money. The whole point of doing that is for this instructor, for this person to take you from this place where you start out of things not looking pretty, of things not looking great, of things uh, being messy, of falling behind the airplane, of not getting everything right to move you and help you along this journey to where you move to a place where not only you could do all those things without the instructor, and that's the goal, but where you could do those things phenomenally well. You know, when I first became an instructor, I thought, they don't teach you this in flight school, when I first became an instructor, I really thought that my job is going to be to teach people how to fly. I thought my job was to take someone who doesn't know or can't yet fly an airplane and teach them how to fly an airplane. And today I realize, after doing this for years, I realize that my job is not to teach people how to fly. That's a byproduct of what I'm doing. But my job is to teach people how to learn, how to control their emotions in situations that are stressful at times, how to be able to shake off a mishap if something gets to you emotionally, let's say you messed up a landing, how do you shake that off so now your brain is now your brain is able to actually learn 
more things in that lesson, I completely underestimated what my job's going to be. I thought I'm going to teach people how to fly. Here's how you land an airplane. Here's how you take off. Here's what this button does. These are all pretty stuff. But the big work that the, the, if you talk to anyone who, I don't talk for everyone, if you talk to most of my students, I will confidently tell you that they will tell you that the biggest thing they took away from training is so much more than just flying an airplane. It's how do I control my emotions when I'm feeling a certain way? How do I, what do I do when I feel like I'm falling behind the airplane? Mentally, right? And so that's my job. And so there's a lot that goes into flight training. And because there's so much that goes into flight training, don't be hard on yourself. Give yourself a break. And you hear me say this in the videos all the time with my students. Mishaps, messing ups, mess ups, uh, uh, things that are done not as good as we wish for them to be. These should be opportunities for us to get excited, to be happy. And the reason that we should get excited is because th when we mess something up, that there's nothing better than a mess up in terms of a learning experience and a learning opportunity. When we mess up a landing, there's few things in the world that will make us not do that again than a bad landing. And you could be the greatest instructor in the world, but a bad landing is a phenomenal, phenomenal learning experience. It's not the only learning experience. It's not the only way you should learn how to land, but it's a phenomenal way to show you what a bad landing looks like and what you won't do again. And so these mishaps, these mess-ups in flight training, which will happen many times, no one comes into flight training and is perfect. Again, if you were, you wouldn't need an instructor. We wouldn't need all these hours of training. So when I say give yourself a break, I really mean understand what the purpose of showing up to flight training in the first place is. And the purpose, that purpose, is to mess up, to not be perfect is to do things wrong. And that is why you're doing those things with a flight instructor next to you who's hopefully competent, patient, trained, um, and understands what their mission is, right? I'll talk, we'll get to it. I think one of the questions here is uh, uh, what makes a great flight instructor? We'll get to that, right? So hopefully your flight instructor is an instructor who is able to provide you the space in which to do all these things. And if they are, if, if your instructor is allowing you to mess up, mess up and feel good, feel okay about it, you know? All that makes you is a student pilot. All that makes you is a student pilot. So I know I, this is a, a, a long answer, but I'm passionate about it. The reason you are a student pilot and not yet a private pilot is because you're in the, think of it as the zone of messing up. It's fine, it's good, it's okay. It's, how, it's part of learning, you know? And so, I hope that makes sense as an answer. I know it's a general answer, it's not something specific, but really if you have this piece, you could, you could master anything in flight training. But if you let things get to you and you are frustrated with yourself. Another thing I didn't mention, my client's um, average age is 40, 45. But the other thing about my clients, which just happens to be the case, is every single one of them holds themselves to a tremendously high standard. This is just the type of people I work with which is a great thing in life. You know, these people uh, have companies and they have all these great things and holding yourself to high standards is phenomenal. But here's where it's not so phenomenal. And here's where this, this is where I have work to do with my clients. Every instructor has different work. My work is to take these people who hold themselves to such high standards and explain to them that they're about to embark on something that won't initially look pretty. They won't be perfect. And the more and better they understand that, the less hard on themselves they'll be when they do mess up a landing as someone who holds themselves to high standards. And so if you're one of those people who holds themselves to high standards, I commend you. It's fantastic. But don't let that part of your personality and your value system to interfere and get in the way of your ability to learn within the flight training world, within your precious time as someone who's learning how to fly. I hope that makes sense. That's my advice. Don't be hard on yourself and understand and appreciate that this is the time for you to be okay with messing up, even after you get your private. Mess ups are phenomenal learning experiences. As long as we're not breaking laws, as long as we're not dead or in a coma, as long as we can reuse the airplane, as long as no one get hurts, gets hurt, we all mess up. 
we all do things not perfect every once in a while, as long as we keep learning from them. That's really the attitude, so I hope that makes sense. All right, more water. Lots of talking. All right, let's see what things are looking like. Looks like 31 minutes left, and should put us on the ground at 12.50 local time. All right. Okay, here we go. Number three. What quality makes a great flight instructor? What quality makes a great flight instructor? I think that's a great question. And I see traffic right there, so what I'll do is I'll transition to heading mode, heading, and I'll go all the way this way to the left to pass behind them, because they're moving this way. They're crossing my path, and so we'll do that. Let's do that. We'll go behind them. There we go. That's good. And they might even be descending. No, we'll keep an eye out. Okay, what quality makes a great flight instructor? I thought about this for a long time. Well, not a long time, because there's so many qualities that I could think of. Uh, by no means am I claiming to be a great flight instructor or am I claiming to have all these qualities, which I'm not even going to talk about qualities. I'm just going to talk about what I think is the top one. And it's something I also don't claim to have, but it's something I can say that I continuously try and develop uh, because I recognize its importance and I recognize how vital it is uh, in order for allowing a student to learn because that's ultimately why we show up to the plane. Uh, I don't show up and meet my clients um, for anything other than them becoming not pilots, but great pilots. I don't develop pilots, I develop great pilots. And there's a lot that goes into doing that. And there's a lot that's required on my end, on my part as well as the instructor, right? There's a lot that I require of my students. There's a lot that I require of myself. So. What makes a great flight instructor? So here we go. Like we said before, there's many qualities, as you can imagine, that make a great flight instructor. In my opinion, the number one quality that will make a great that makes a great flight instructor. And I'm confident if you ask yourself, if you're a student pilot and you have an instructor who has this quality, you'll know how helpful it is. Or even better, if you have an instructor who doesn't have this quality, you'll be able to attest to how difficult learning could be at times. What makes a great flight instructor, the word begins with a P, and it is patience. Patience, patience, patience. You know, as instructors, we talk a lot about how the student should have patience when it comes to learning how to land, or getting your license, or soloing the airplane, right? We, we ask a lot of patience of our students. How often, as instructors, do we ask patience of ourselves? How often, as instructors, do we show up to the plane and say, today I'm going to be patient with my students? Just like we expect our students to show up to the plane and ask themselves to be patient with themselves. And so it's very easy as an instructor, especially here's the other thing, as instructors, if you're an instructor watching this, you can attest to this. As instructors, all these things we're teaching people how to do, how to do well, we've seen and done a million times. We could do it in our sleep. We could do it with our eyes closed. And it takes a great instructor to remind themselves and fully know and understand how their student sees that same maneuver, that same task, that same whatever, in a very different way than we do. The lenses our students have on looking at uh, a landing or looking at a takeoff or looking at, looking at slow flight or looking at flying an airplane as a whole, the lenses our students wear are very different lenses 
than the ones we have seeing those same things. And that, as you can see, can create a big problem. Because if the instructor and student show up to a flight and they're both wearing different lenses seeing the same thing, let's say the, uh, let's talk about steep turns. The instructor sees steep turns in one way and the student sees it in a completely different way. Maybe the student is afraid of steep turns. So that's a big problem, right? If we're seeing the same thing in very different ways, that's a big problem. So I'm not saying that instructors should see a landing, should think of a landing the way student pilots do. You can't. You've done it a million times. You could do it in your sleep. It's second nature to you. Um, so, so the question is, what could we do as an instructor, or what could you do as a great instructor, in order to get yourself to a point where you could come closer to seeing things from your student's perspective? And there's many things we could do, but the biggest thing, the biggest thing that I find, I find helps me, and the biggest thing that I appreciated with my instructors when I was learning how to fly, is patience. If we ask as instructors of patience from ourselves, what happens when, when we do that and we do it well, the better we do that and we're able to say, okay, be patient, slow down, ask yourself, how did you see this when you were in their shoes? Don't be hard on your student when they uh, mess something up or when they see something in a way that's not correct or whatever that might be. Patience, 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 patience. When you are patient as an instructor, it's amazing what that allows you to do in other realms as well. Because if I'm not patient with my students, I don't have the opportunity to even figure out a way in which I could teach them something in maybe a different way that would work better for them. If I'm not patient, all I am is frustrated. All I am is not only frustrated, they're frustrated too. But if I'm patient and I'm able to understand when I was in their shoes, when I was in that seat, all I needed from my instructor was really patience. Uh, the more I'm able to give that, the more I'm able to ask and get that of myself for the sake of my student and for my sake. It's amazing how more fun this whole thing becomes when we have a lot of patience, right? Um, it's incredible. So the biggest thing that I could tell my answer to this question of what makes a great flight instructor, in my humble opinion, is patience. The more patient you're able to be with yourself, with your students, with everything, the more it will open everything up and really enable you to do a much better job uh, as an instructor. And finally, the biggest thing that patience allows in a classroom, in an airplane, in any learning environment, patience allows for learning and better learning to take place. You know, I was telling a student of mine the other day, a student of mine did something, I forget what it was, and uh, his reaction to it was, oops, you know, I messed something, whatever, he was saying something. And I told him, I said, I looked at him and I said, you know what? I said, here's something I learned and realized as a teacher since I started teaching. And I never thought of it this way. And I looked at him and I said, I said, great teachers make learning allowed. And here's what I mean by that. You might think, what do you mean learning aloud? That's what we're doing here. But if you think about it, really what is learning? Part of, a huge part of learning is messing up. A huge part of learning is not getting things right the first time. And great teachers understand that messing up and not getting things right the first time is just as part of learning as eventually getting to a place where you do things right. It's an inevitable, it's, it's, it's as much a part of it as anything. And so a great teacher, a great flight instructor, makes messing up allowed. Not only allowed, but well-cooked, right? We look forward to getting ourselves into pickles. Not negligence, not dangerous, not illegal, but getting ourselves into situations where we see, oops, I won't do that again. Those things stick in your head in our phenomenal learning experience. So great instructors know that in order to do all that, in order to get to a point where I can create such an environment for my student and for myself, because I'm learning too, right? It's not just my student. If my student does something, I'm human. I'm picking up on that. I'm learning too. I'm walking away from the session with gained knowledge and a deeper understanding of what I will and won't do in the future, right? Many times it's things I haven't thought about before. And so the only way to get to that point is through patience. If you show up as an instructor and you ask patience of yourself, not only from your students, you'll be amazed that just it opens everything up. And the learning experience, and your students ultimately learn that much more and faster. It's higher quality learning 
it's amazing. And once they're no longer with you or they're out there in the system as pilots, they don't kick themselves every time they mess up. You know, many of my students, I'm so thankful I'm in touch with all of my students. They all text me every once in a while, hey, I just got back from a flight. You won't believe what happened. They call me sometimes, they debrief me, they'll share with me something crazy that happened. And you know why they feel comfortable sharing with me, with me crazy stuff? Because they know that, first of all, of course there won't be any judgment, but they also know that every single time, the answer is the same. What did you learn from it? And we talk about it. And uh, so I'm thankful for that. It's unbelievable. And so, um, again, patience, 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 patience. Patience will make the entire flight training um, time together with an instructor and student, and even your time as an instructor, that much more pleasant. So patience, in my opinion, is the number one thing you should shoot for, um, or more of if you already have some of it as a flight instructor. More water. Look at that. All right, looks like 22 minutes left. Should put us on the ground at 12.51 local time. All right, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see. Okay, where are we at? I thought I'll be able to get through uh, <laughs> seven questions in this uh, hour and 20 minute flight, but I forgot how much I talk. And so um, it is what it is. If we don't finish it now, we have many more flights together to talk about things, so. All right, number four, how can I get on your calendar? Again, not verbatim, This is these are just questions that people ask again. So people, want to fly out. Many people fly out. They want to fly uh, together. Uh, many people in the Southern California area um, who are local want to fly together. So people email me and say, hey, how can I get in California? So really, the currently, currently, um, there is a website in the works. So I do have a website coming up, uh, which I'm really excited to share and release once it's complete. But right now, um, the way I'm doing it is the way I have been doing it. And that is really people, the way people get a hold of me is email. So there should be, on the YouTube channel, there's, there's a homepage, I think, and then videos, and then uh, community, there's these different tabs. And then if you go to the one all the way to the right, it's called About, I think About page on YouTube, there should be a button you can press and see an email. So there's an email associated with the channel. Um, and that's how people have and currently still do um, get a hold of me. So the same email you'd reach out to ask me a question, that's really the only way to communicate. So if you want to get on my calendar, if you want to fly together sometime, whether you're local or not, many people fly out with their own planes, um, just email me, let me know, you know, I'll check my calendar, my schedule, and we will, uh, if I'm able to, we will put something down and fly together. So like I said, there is a website in the works coming up. I'm really excited to share that once it's complete. But until then, the best way to get in touch with me in regards to flying together um, is e reaching out uh, via email, um, which again should be on the About section of the YouTube channel. And there we have it. Sometimes it's not immediate. You want to reach out. You want to say, hey, can we fly together this week or next week? And I'd be booked out. But typically I'm able to accommodate within the month um, of you reaching out, something like that. So I hope that's helpful. Any advice on buying my first airplane? This is a good one. I won't spend a lot of time on it because I want to actually, you know what? Let's see, what are the other questions? Advice on buying my airplane. You know what, I want to plow through these. I have, yeah, 20 minutes. I want to plow through these questions 
uh, I should, I, want, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but here we go. Any advice on buying my first airplane? So here's something I run into with my students a lot, but also people email me, e email me just about buying, they're about to buy a plane and they want my input. So here's what I'll tell people, what I tell people and I'll tell you. When you're learning how to fly and you're looking to buy your first airplane, many people buy their first airplane while not yet even a certificated pilot. So maybe they're getting their plane to learn how to fly on. Uh, some people just got their private and they want to buy a plane. So here's what I tell people. The thing you need to understand about your first airplane is just that. It's in the ter sentence I just said. It is your first airplane. It is not your last airplane. And I'll say that again. The biggest thing you need to understand about your first airplane is that it is your first airplane. It is not your only airplane you'll ever own, and it is not your last airplane. It is your first airplane. And when people start thinking of their first airplane in those, through those lenses, in understanding that they're, whether you're just fresh out of uh, flight training or you're not even a pilot, you want to learn how to fly, the possibility of you as a new pilot falling so far behind the airplane is so great initially to where getting a plane that flies crazy fast yeah, it's appealing, you'll get places faster, but you need to realize you might be working against you in terms of really honing in and developing that foundation as a pilot. And so what I tell people is, your first airplane is your first airplane. It doesn't have to be your last, and you don't have to own it for more than a year or two years. It's simply your first airplane. It's that first airplane that you're not only learning how to fly better and be a better pilot. You're also, remember, learning how to be an airplane owner with. Airplane ownership is a whole learning experience in and of itself. Required maintenance. Uh, all these things that when you show up to a flight school and rent a plane that you don't have to deal with, now as the plane owner, you kind of do. You kind of stay on, you got to stay on top of stuff. Unless, of course, you hire someone like myself or other people out there, I'm sure other people do it, I'm not sure uh, who specifically, to take care of all that headache for you. But if you're not one of those people, if you don't know someone like me, or if there's not someone like me in your area, or whatever the reason might be, there's a lot that you have to now take care of and become familiar with and really learn. And some of it's annoying, you know? Aircraft ownership is not always a walk in the park. It's just part of what comes with it. And so what I tell people is when you buy your first airplane or you're looking to purchase, you're in the market for a new plane, remember this is not only the plane that you're going to develop and grow your pilot foundation, you're also using this plane, your first airplane, as an opportunity, as that first plane that you learned how to be an aircraft owner with, which might, believe it or not, change how and which planes you might be looking at. Because if you show up and you go, okay, I'm looking to buy a plane, and here's my mission, my grandchildren live in Phoenix, and my wife lives in, uh, I don't know where, and my whatever lives here, and I haven't even gotten my private, and you don't really know what goes into flight training, or you don't even yet understand what falling behind the airplane means in terms of you know, flying 200 miles an hour through the air, and your brain not yet thinking that fast. Um, if you're in that kind of place, and you show up, and you don't think of it as your first plane, as that first plane that you might even just own for a year, if you think of it long term, you might get a plane that's too big and too fast for you at the moment, when you don't have to. So when you show up to your first airplane purchase experience, remember, 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 it's your first airplane. It doesn't have to be fast. Think about the, of, of the reasons you're going to get it. You're going to develop your pilot foundation in it. You're going to become a better pilot. You don't want to go crazy fast. You want to give yourself time to learn. You're going to learn how to be an aircraft owner, right? So maybe don't get the most expensive crazy thing. Just kind of get a feel for what aircraft maintenance looks like. How much do things cost to repair? How often do they break? Dip your toes in the water and then jump in if you want a year or two years later. So that's my biggest advice. And that's really the biggest unfortunate thing that people showing up to buy their first plane really don't understand for good reason. Unless you hear it from me or from someone else, um, keep this in mind. It's only your first airplane which you don't have to own forever. So don't be as emotionally attached to the idea that it has to be this and it has to be that. So don't, uh, don't be hard on yourself with that. So I hope that makes sense. That's my opinion and advice on buying your first airplane. All right, let's go ahead and initiate here a descent and then we'll move on to
question number six. Look at that. We're moving through it. All right, here we go. Good old descent. Everything looks good. Looks like we will be on the ground in 13 minutes, 12.52 local time. All right. Should all pilots get their instrument rating? This is a great question, especially if, if you live in Southern California, uh, where I do. Um, it's a great question. So many, actually most of my, all my students, um, some of them don't even ask the question. They're like, okay, let's get our, let's get moving on instrument. But many people actually have this question because they don't understand or fully know how and why, what instrument is good for. So people are curious. Should all private pilots get their instrument, or should all people get their instrument once they're done with private? So the answer is this. You don't have to, of course. They're completely two separate things. Um, but here's my opinion on that. I'll answer specifically with LA, and then I'll answer in general. Not only LA, but certain geographical areas where the weather has some phenomena, some different things uh, that might necessitate an instrument rating. So for example, in LA, we have our famous marine layer. And that's very prevalent in the summer months especially. And that's where you just have this blanket, this not probably about 500 feet thick, if that, maybe give or take. Um, and it just sits right on top. It moves in or from the water when the, in the uh, evening hours and in the morning, and it just sits there. Sometimes it burns off at around noon, but it sits there. So it's this layer of clouds, which underneath is all, you look up and it's just complete overcast. But above this thin layer, is completely sunny in VFR conditions. And so in LA, if you're a private pilot, this layer, which happens to just be there all the time, or most days, might very well prevent you from being able to fly to where you want to fly to and uh, depart and fly and execute your missions as a VFR private pilot. And so just for that reason alone, if you're someone who says, you know what, I have the money and time to spare, I have the brain space to learn instrument training, to do instrument training. Um, I, and by the way, there's more benefits to it, which I'll talk about in a moment. But if you're someone who says, you know what? All those things, the, the uh, peace of mind that I will get and have by not being limited or um, uh, grounded by every time this layer sitting on top of my airport, that peace of mind is worth it for me. Uh, then I say 100%. I think everyone in Southern California should get their instrument rating for that reason alone. Now, I'm not familiar with the weather, what the specific weather stuff look like in different areas of the country, but you do. So wherever you live, whatever weather stuff happened there, which might necessitate an instrument rating, if that's the case, ask yourself, is the peace of mind to be able to just depart and fly really most of the times that I want? Because sometimes you want to fly and there's convective activity and you should, even with an instrument rating. But really most days, Right? Do I wish to, is the peace of mind of not being limited and grounded by clouds worth it for me? For many people, the answer is yes. And if that's you, if you're one of those people, I say go for it. Instrument rating is a phenomenal, phenomenal tool uh, that we have as pilots in order to operate in the system. Legally and safely, really, there's a lot of proficiency that goes into it, how to fly in a cloud. Um, but that's one side of it. The other side of it, too, and I said this on the channel before, is a few things... I learned more during instrument than how little I knew as a pilot, how limited my perspective was as a pilot uh, during private. There's a saying in life, it's true with everything, until you learn new things, you don't know what you don't know. You know, it, It's just when we gain new perspectives that we're able to look back and go, wow, I can't believe my, my view of something was so limited, or I can't believe I didn't know this. And what instrument training does for many pilots, it, is, it expands your horizons as a pilot. It expands your view of the air traffic control system, of the system, the, of the uh, system as a whole. Of so many things start making sense to you. Oh, that's why they do that that way in private. 
to keep me away from IFR traffic or to supplement this and this and instrument approaches. And oh, that's why this airspace is that shape because there's instrument approaches and I never understood why they always vectored me here. And now I get what, and it's amazing what getting your instrument really does for you in terms of just opening and broadening your horizons as a pilot. Forget using it. Even if you live in Phoenix and you never fly in a cloud, it's incredible what it does to you mentally. The final part of this is comes down always to what I always say flying is about. I always say that flying is probably one of the most rewarding, healthy, fun, challenging, um, um, What's the word? Um, I just forgot the word I was looking for. But flying is one of the most rewarding, challenging things that you could do in your life. It's a very freeing feeling but it, once you wrap up training and you go, wow, I just learned this new thing. And because flying is that, very much so, instrument really just takes that to a whole other level. If you felt rewarded, if you felt like private pilot training was rewarding, if you felt like, wow, I can't believe I acquired this new skill, and now I'm able to do it on my own without my flying instructor, you will really feel that when you fly IFR alone through a cloud during sunset or even cloud surfing. You, see, you get to see things that are just unbelievably beautiful and amazing. And so really all around for proficiency reasons, for broadening your horizons as a pilot, not to mention the specific weather phenomena that happens where you live that might necessitate an instrument rating in order for you to not be grounded. For all these reasons I just mentioned, I am a firm believer that if you have the time, money, and brain space to really learn, don't just do it. If you do it, do it right. There's a lot that goes in the instrument. Find yourself a great flight instructor. Find yourself someone with, with whom you click, you think you could learn stuff with. You think they could inspire you. You think you could look up to them. You, you, you think their knowledge is good. Find yourself a good one. Shop around. But if you can afford to do all those things, I say go for it. I think every single pilot would be much better off with an instrument rating, even if you never utilized or exercised uh, its benefits ever. There's so many things that go beyond that, which are reasons I believe that you should get your instrument rating. So I hope this helps. Should, you get your, should everyone get their instrument rating? In my opinion, in a perfect world, yes. But I know we don't live in a perfect world, and not everything is about my opinion. But if you can make that happen for yourself, go for it. You'll be really, really happy that you did. So I hope that's helpful with uh, instrument training. More water. All right, what else is on here? Okay, so the final question is any check ride advice. I have a lot of it um, and very little time left to our flight. Looks like we'll be on the ground in six and a half minutes. So uh, I, was hoping, I was hoping I'd get through seven questions, but we only got through six, which is good considering how much I talk. Uh, but I guess we'll have to leave that seventh one for another time, which we'll have a lot of. And so, uh, yeah. We'll talk a lot about check rides uh, in these flights, as there is a lot to talk about. People are curious about all that. In fact, what I might do is I'll take all the check ride questions I've received and break it down to the specific questions uh, that people ask most and maybe make a flight talking about that. We'll see what happens. But anyhow, I hope this flight was helpful. As I called it before, it's an email question a uh, answering flight. I did my best. Um, I hope the information I provided you found helpful. Uh, I hope you're able to maybe you could resonate with something or maybe you realize something or maybe you learned something, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, the reason I do this, the reason I turn the camera on and I spend the time talking and I interact with people via email or in person many times is just because how passionate I am. And so if this is helpful for you, all that better. Um, and if these videos keep you going with flight training or uh, really advance your um, experience in this world of aviation, uh, then I did my part. This is my passion, and I really hope that, uh, that these answers gave you a little more clarity. Uh, and if you're one of those who actually emailed and asked, asked these uh, questions, 
then uh, I hope I was able to expand a little more than even what I emailed you back uh, with my answer on email. So there we have it. I see the airport right over there. Plane will turn left here in a moment. There's four five. What I'll do is actually I'll lower the floor. I'll lower the floor to 27, which is our TPA. There we go. And I'm 10 to the south. Toronto traffic, white Cessna is 10 to the south, 4,500 descending, make left traffic, 17, full stop, Toronto. All right, let's go to do this, autopilot off, and we'll fly the airplane, we'll hand fly it. There we are. Okay, lights are on, cow flaps is open, fuel selectors both. Now we'll get the profit mixture in here in a little bit. And we're good to go. We'll get a uh, visual approach, 1-7, just for situational awareness. And there we have it. It's right there. That's my final approach course. So it's great for if you want to parallel an airport on a downwind. It's a phenomenal tool, especially at night. If you can't really see things outside, use the tools you have available to you in the airplane. And it looks like the wind is a three knot tailwind from behind me, which is so far favoring runway 17, so that's good. Beautiful clear day in Death Valley, look at that. There's 36 for 27. Lovacool. All right, there's 33 for 27. Traffic, White Cessna is 5 to the south, making left traffic, 1-7, full stop, Toronto. All right, there's 3,000 for 27. There's the airport, 11 o'clock. Twenty nine for twenty seven. All right, prop. There's twenty eight for twenty seven. And there's twenty seven. Seven and 100 knots, downwind. Toronto traffic, white Cessna's left downwind, 17, full stop, Toronto. There we go, paralleling the final approach course. And we're just hanging out. 
All is good to go. Again, fuel selector, both cow flaps open. Prop mixture, full forward trims look good. Flaps are up. I'll get them down here in a moment. Lights are all on. And everything is kosher. 2,700 knots. Things are good. There's the airport off the left. And yeah, it looks like the winds are favoring 1-7, as they typically do. Typically do. All right, there's a beam by touchdown point. Reduce power. Here comes flaps 10. I'll counter that balloon. Beautiful day. Toronto traffic, white test turning left base, so one seven, full stop, Toronto. All right, here comes flaps 20, final is clear. Go flaps full. Toronto traffic, white test turning final, one seven, full stop, Toronto. There we go. Nice and hot here. It's 32 Celsius right now. Not even on the ground. Probably be 40. Welcome to Toronto. Pressure off the nose wheel. There we go. All right, flaps come up. over here. All right, you guys. Hope you guys enjoyed the flight. Thanks for coming along. And uh, again, I hope the question answering was helpful. As always, if you have a question yourself that you want me to talk about, go ahead and send me an email. The email is in the about section or page of the YouTube channel. And um, I'll cover it at some point either through email or here on the flights. And there we have it. Got it turned around. There we go. Nose wheel straight. Perfect. All right. Thanks for coming along. Hope you enjoy the flight, and I will see you guys on the next one. Here we go.